<laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hey, first of all, good morning. It's a super great Army Day. It's uh, super great to be here with some dear friends over the years. Jim, thanks for putting this and hosting this. Really a great opportunity, and we really appreciate all the work that you do uh, to help us as we make good decisions on, in, our, in our nation's outcomes. Um, General Munt was right. When I was in E3, hypersonics was not part of my lexicon. And not one time when I was sitting in a foxhole as an infantry soldier did I say to myself, one day I'll be making hypersonic weapons. But here we are, so we're super excited to be here. I, I do want to point out, uh, Mr. Darborough, if you could stand up. Uh, he's here with us. He's our deputy here in the National Capital Region. And uh, he does a great job of keeping us uh, straight as we go through this. And so we're really excited to, ha to have Mr. Darborough and, and the whole table there as part of our team. We, we are at a unique time in our nation's history. And that unique time sometimes calls for a different set of behaviors within the rule sets, within the law, that we need to execute and bring warfighting capability to our nations so that our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Space Force can bring that to bear should we be called upon to do that. And your, your nation is doing that today with the help of our industry partners. Uh, so just in a few minutes here this morning, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. Uh, if you could go to the, to the slides. Are we going to show the slides? Go, go to the next one, if you would. So let me start out with, with just saying thank you to industry and those partners that are here today. We could not be here unless you were also willing to change the behavior within your industry. And you've done that. Uh, and it's incredible to watch it happen. And what I'm finding as we do this kind of work together that we actually want to do it differently. And then once we find out it's okay to do it differently, the pace of acceleration increases. And so there's a couple of pictures up there that are really important. Uh, so on the night, uh, 14th of February, 2019, the Secretary of the Army called me in, and this was, happened to be uh, Secretary McCarthy at the time, and said, Neil, I want you to deliver an offensive hypersonic weapon in FY23, what are your questions? And like General Munt just said, I said, well, let me figure out how to spell hypersonics first. And it was really clear. And the reason it was really clear is because as we spent the last 20 years of our nation on the global war on terror, and that's really important that we use the word global, because we're helping the entire globe with terrorism, not just us, that our adversaries were modernizing. And then in 2018, we changed our national defense strategy. And of course, now we're focused on China and Russia, great power what we call great power competition. And so they were modernizing. And so we got a little bit behind in some technology areas. And so we needed an organization to behave a little bit different. Uh, and so they, they asked us to stand up this organization. And so we're, we are a direct report to the Secretary of the Army. Uh, and we work with the, what we call the Board of Directors, the six senior leaders of the Army who help us make decisions. And if you want to make decisions fast, you have to have a short decision cycle, right? You, when you want to make decisions fast with the industry, we have a strong partnership. In my meetings, a uh, little unusual are all my industry partners. I share all my EVMS data, all my money data. I sell my R forms. We are completely transparent in our business, and we believe in that behavior that transparency equals speed. And then when we have some industry partners in our meetings, uh, I tell them right up front, the person that's in the meeting needs to be a decision maker. And, uh, and the first time you do that, and they, I say, hey, I need a decision from you right now, and they go, I need to go talk to somebody, don't ever bring that person back. <laughs> Don't need that kind of person. I need somebody that can make a decision as we, at this pace of decision making uh, so we can be at the pace we need to. So we're really grateful for industry's partnership in this and then with all the other agencies and organizations in the Army that make this happen. And we start every one of our meetings with what we call, I learned this from General Nicholson in Afghanistan, common understanding and shared visualization. Every meeting we start with, that, that, that construct, and I, and I walk through that. So hypersonics is not complicated. Success in hypersonics is defined as delivering an offensive hypersonic battery by midnight on 30 September 23. 1201 is called failure. It's that simple. <laughs> and, we, and we move to that focus and to that outcome. Same with our mid-range capability. 30 September midnight is called success. 1201 is called failure. And then, and, and with that focus and that clarity, then we, we don't have any problem with the entire 
vertical chain of command, understanding what we need to accomplish. And, and I'll pull that string a little bit. In hypersonics, for example, there are six key industrial partners, none of which can do it alone, can't be done alone. There is an emerging industrial base for hypersonics. In other words, 30 months ago, there was no industrial base. It was all done in the S&T world. And we're transitioning that now to the industrial base. In order to do that, we needed those six partners to have one integrated master schedule, one integrated earned value management system. And I will tell you, the first six months of that was a little tenuous. Uh, we don't want to base the R cards. <laughs> and they're holding those cards pretty close. That's not the case anymore, 100% transparency. Sometimes in the meetings, we shift workload from one company to another company. It, it is a single unit moving forward, and, and that's what we need to do at pace. And we do the same thing in mid-range capability. We do the same thing in directed energy, a high energy lasers, high power microwaves uh, to move forward. And when you do those kind of focused things and change the behavior a little bit, then you get a different outcome. So from a mission receipt on 14 February 2019, we delivered the first hypersonic battery eight months ago. Uh, they have gone through all of their new equipment training, and they're now ready to do their mission set. That's wicked fast at a wicked hard pace. And we have taken risk, right? We take risk in design. As we're buying elements, we're designing elements. Uh, and then now we're finishing the design and the build of our missile systems. And we do this jointly. By the way, hypersonics we do jointly with the Navy. Vice Admiral Johnny Wolf, a good friend of mine, my battle buddy, known him for many years. Then we do that together. We share a common missile, a common glide body, and some common command and control elements for our programs. Uh, and so it's really, really a challenge to do this uh, at this pace and this speed. Uh, but that focus is what we have for everything we do. We know the definition of success. We know the timeline. And, and to the credit of our nation and the leadership in the Army, we've, we've been given every penny that we've asked for uh, to execute that mission set. And so we're pretty excited about that. Go to the next slide, if you would. I, I want to I talk about a different thing other than hypersonics and directed energy where I spend the majority of my day. My number one priority is offensive hypersonic weapons. Uh, there is no other. <laughs> if I have an extra minute in the day, that's where I spend my time. But our organization also has a unique responsibility, and this falls under Mr. Darborough, to bring innovation to the Army. The Army wants to be and is a technology leader. Uh, and you can see us pressing that on many fronts. The Army modernization strategy that General Munt just talked about is about bringing current day technology and setting the conditions for future technology to be brought into the force. So planning beyond 2028, planning beyond 2030, and what do we need in that realm? And so this is our outreach to you, that if you have an idea, we are listening. And a matter of fact, we have a, a method to give you that ear. And we do this in a couple of ways. The first way is what we call uh, ASTRA. Think of it as uh, an industry day. We send a problem statement out to industry. And Mr. Darbro and his team does this. We send a problem statement out to industry. And, and we say, we have this problem. If you have something that solves the problem, we'd like to know. And we respond to white papers. Now, this is not S&T work. We're, we're not trying to help you go solve and build a widget. We, we need a widget that's built. Now, we might modify it a little bit for what we want. But this is really relatively mature technologies. And so we just had one of these at Fort Bragg. We do, we do it at different places around the country. And, and we selected from uh, over 400 uh, respondents. We selected down to about 30 that came to Fort Bragg. And we do a, a little uh, what we call pitch days. If you've seen Shark Tank on TV, it's exactly like that. <laughs> it's exactly like that. Uh, you get, the company gets 30 minutes to present what, they, what we think is a good idea. We have 15 minutes for questions, and then we, we tell them right there on the spot. We want that. Here's a contract. Let's go make that. Uh, and it's really, really interesting. I tell you, there are some innovative companies out there, some innovative ideas. And I'm amazed at the things that are happening that Companies have no idea how to get a hold of somebody in the government to do this. Uh, so we're that group, right? So Mr. Darborough and his team do, does that very well. The other thing that you hear our chief of staff of the Army talk about this a lot is counter small UAS. So you, you probably recognize that about a year and a half ago, the, the Department of Defense stood up an executive agency for counter small UAS. That responsibility was given to the Army, and that was given to Major General Sean Ganey has that responsibility for the department 
to, to coalesce what we're doing in Counter Small UAS. Our organization was immediately assigned as the material arm to that organization. And so we have a joint role we play with Counter Small US, and I'm the, department, the department's lead for the material solutions for Counter Small UAS. Uh, we believe, and if you heard General McConville talk, our great uh, chief of staff of our Army, if you've heard him talk, then, then you'll know that that is a high issue, high priority issue for our Army. Uh, because it is a growing market on the threat side, which means it needs to be increased on the defense side. As a result of that, uh, we, we, we follow the very similar uh, methodology that we do with our industry day. So we have two twice a year. We, we do what we call semi-annual demonstrations. And this is bring what you have to the range. We're going to do a live fire event. If we like it, we're going to buy it. <laughs> this isn't a PowerPoint slide. This isn't we got to go work on it. This is bring it to the range. We're going to do a live fire event. The next one is in April. It's coming up pretty quick. Uh, this is our third one that we've had. And uh, on this particular one, we're doing high power microwaves, high energy lasers, and counter US as a service. And if you want some more about that, then you can see Mr. Darbro. He can square you away with a ton of information. This is bring what you have. We're going to put it in a live fire event in an operational relevant environment and see if it works. And if it works, we're going to, we're going to make a contract with you and, and allow all the services the opportunity to buy it based on what their mission set is. I give you those two examples to highlight what I, where I started with, which is it is okay to do things differently. What you do not get relief on is standards, safety, and time, right? And I tell all, all the folks that come in and talk to us, uh, you know, Steve Cook is here, is doing a super job with us on, on many areas. It doesn't matter what kind of contract you think you have, it's firm fixed price. It is, there is no more money coming. For the thing we asked you to do, that's, what, that's all we're going to give you to do it, and it's all the time you're going to get. There is, no, there is no second day in my world. It is midnight, 30 September 23 for hypersonics is success. Earlier at 11.59 is even better. At 12.01, it's just called failure. And so when you have that focus and you have the support of the leadership, that's, it, it, becomes, uh, it makes a wicked hard problem a little more tenable. The other thing that we do, it's a little bit unique, is, is Mr. Darbro and Ms. Holmes, our deputy down in, in, in Huntsville, we go to Congress every quarter and we lay out every penny. Matter of fact, I give to the Congress the same metrics I look at. I, I don't even change the slide. I don't make a special slide for Congress. I lay out every penny, totally transparent with them. Uh, so, and, and when you have that transparency, it builds trust. And that's why I said earlier, trust equals speed in my world. Um, so we're super excited to have this mission set. It is, it is a wicked hard problem. Uh, and every day we wake up and, and we're hitting the ground running. And I don't want you to think we don't have problems. We do. But that's why we get paid, right? To solve, to solve hard problems in real time. Uh, all the work that we're doing in hypersonics, directed energy, mid-range, is because somebody started an idea in the S&T world a long time ago. Uh, and in S&T world, where they do invention and demonstration, is what I would call that, sets the conditions for an organization like mine to do prototyping. Prototyping to us is defined as not making one of a thing. <laughs> that, that's called an invention and a demonstration. Uh, to us, when we build a prototype, it is what we call a to at a combat unit of action level. It's a platoon, company, battalion, brigade level set of equipment that we give to a combat unit to see if it works in an operationally relevant environment. That's prototyping. Making one of a thing is called an invention and demonstration. That's not what we do. We take that idea, finish the design, complete the work, give it to a combat unit, and let them try that in an operational relevant environment. And that's really important because now for the first time, uh, and I, it just seems simple now that you look back, we, we now can write a requirement document called the capabilities design document, and we actually know the thresholds that can be built. We no longer have to have a threshold document that we know, don't know if it can be built or not. And so now we know what we wanted to improve. Uh, we, we keep track of what we want improvements on so we know what block two should look like, block three should look like as we go forth. This organization is not the build a lot organization. This organization is designed to go at pace to build a combat unit of action so we can give the Army a decision before they spend a bunch of money and a bunch of time writing a requirement document and going to an EMD milestone program uh, that's what we're designed to do. 
And so as we do that, we move really, at, really quickly at pace and, and in order to get to that decision point. And then if it's a yes, then, then some PEO will, in the Army will build that. I see Bill Borf is here. Uh, or, or we go, no, we tried it. It didn't work. We didn't like it. Let's kill it right now. Don't spend any more money on it. In business, you would call that fail fast, fail early. Same kind of construct. And then the last thing I'll mention, and then we'll open it up for questions, is uh, we're organized a little bit different than most government organizations. So of all the things that we're doing, we have a core team of 78 people. That's it. Uh, and we hire people for a task, and then we disaggregate that team. Aggregate team, very much like a venture capitalist organization. Right, very small core organization. We get a task and a mission set from the Secretary of the Army. We hire a team, do that task, disband the task. All, if the answer is yes in hypersonics, all the money, all the people go to, in this case, PO missiles in space. I don't keep any residual money. I don't keep any residual capability. Very different way to do business in the government, but very effective if you want to move at pace. So we're super excited about that. And, and uh, luckily uh, for our organization, our leadership has given us a little bit of lead way. And, as I tell the chief of staff of the Army all the time, I hope that my feet hit the ground before the slack runs out of the rope. Uh, that'll be a good outcome. <laughs> so I'll pause right there for, for quick, just for any questions, and I'll, I have some concluding comments. Yes, sir. Three, three minutes, sir. We, get, we got time. Yes, Go. Sir. Go ahead. General Thurgood, Son Perico. You mentioned in passing the CDS as a firm. Can you elaborate on what you think about that? Yeah, so for, for a, long, a long time, uh, we bought, bought uh, particular products as, and we provided those to soldiers. Um, and that, that's been the model for a long time. And maybe it's time to change that model a little bit. May, maybe what we need to do is, is have a company that, that we say, we, we want you to defend this area. You figure out what systems you need and how many time and money you need to do that, and let's see if that's a, we can use that model. Um, may not work in all environments. May be really good in Conus, may be really bad in combat, right? We, we don't know, but we're willing to try it. So instead of, instead of putting, putting the buying widgets and then putting them together on, in the, on the department, uh, we're going to try to do that with a company. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. I think, Mr. Darbo, we have five companies that are coming out to do that demonstration. So, so it's a li again, you know, it's a little bit out of the box. Um, you know, we, we try to approach problems a little bit different. Uh, it may work, it may not. It's okay. Either way, we'll, we'll have a good answer. One more. Sure, go ahead. There's more. One more question? Go ahead. There's one over there. Where are you? Thank you. Hi, Jen Judson Hi. with Defense News. Um, I wanted to ask where you are in your test schedule for the hypersonic. Um, I know it's shifted a little bit, um, but also, you know, there's been a push to test more, you know, fail often, keep testing, um, and sort of an argument that we do not test enough. Uh, so just wanted to know what your thoughts were on those comments. Yeah, thanks. Good to see you. Uh, it, you know, testing is... Um, when we give a piece of equipment to a soldier, uh, I'm the one that personally has to sign the document. It's called the Capabilities and Limitations Release. And there, there's one thing that's not negotiable in that document for me, and it's the safety, health, and well-being of our soldiers as, as they use this equipment. I, I don't care if I ever deliver nothing. I am not going to deliver something that's going to hurt a soldier as we use that piece of weapon. So the testing that you're talking about does that for us, right? It proves that it's safe enough to use. It proves that our soldiers can use it and it proves that it will, it will do the mission that we asked it to do. And so everything we have, we have a very deliberate uh, test schedule. Hypersonics has a very deliberate schedule. Uh, directed energy, mid-range capability, uh, counter small UAS, everything is, has a very deliberate test schedule. So that I feel comfortable as a senior leader releasing that to the soldiers that it's safe and reliable and won't, won't hurt our soldiers when we're using it. And so we shift that around all those times. Look, every day we wake up, it is, uh, it, uh, you're running. It's a challenge every day. And so as we do that, um, you shift things and balance things in the decision-making process. What we can't do is skip any tests. That's not, that's not in the acceptable world, right? you, you got to do the test. Uh, and so we focus on, uh, you know, sometimes when you're, 
uh, down in the bowels of an organization, you get pretty passionate about emotional about your test or your objectives. And you want to get to the test because Thurgood's driving you to get to this timeline. So we get to you know, midnight 23. And, and I tell the team all the time, don't come in near the test and say, we want to change the criteria. We want to change the objectives. That's not success, <laughs> right? That's just making us feel good. Uh, so I'd rather move a test than skip an objective or skip a thing that I know is going to make it safe for our soldiers. So we, we adjust any program that's going to be successful will do that. They'll adjust that as we go to keep ourselves on track. Okay, let me, let me just close up real quick, if I could, Jim. Yes, sir. Uh, kind of where I started. So uh, to our partners who are here in industry, thank you for what you're doing. Look, we've asked you to do a wicked hard thing, and you have responded, and you have responded well. Uh, every day is a challenge, and we thank you for your efforts and, and for what we're doing. We're grateful, we're lucky to have the leadership in our Army that we have today. Uh, the idea of having a Futures Command tied to the, to the acquisition materials side of our Army together, and that partnership is strong, and, and, and it's continuing to be modified as we learn and grow. And it's important that we recognize that. Uh, and then the, the last thing I would say is, on the material side, uh, we're excited about what we're doing. But here's what we really do. And, and if you remember one thing today, I wish it would be this. Material doesn't win wars. Material gives our soldiers the opportunity to come home. That's what we do. We give them the opportunity, should they use it correctly, should it work correctly, to come home. And so when you're tired and hungry and Thurgood's yelling at you, because you're half a second late, and I will if you're half a second late, then remember that what we do is give our soldiers the opportunity to come home. And when you see a soldier jump out of a box at halftime and surprise their family, and you see a, a, a soldier going to a school on the, one of those come home videos, I love those things, you gave them that opportunity by being on time or, or early and by making the system work. And our soldiers need and deserve everything we can give them. And I'd ask you in closing, to keep them in your thoughts and prayers. They need all we can give them, every effort, every minute, every breath we can do to provide them the opportunity, should we be successful, to come home. So thanks for what you're doing. God bless you. Thanks for everything, Army Strong. Cool. Well spoken, sir.